Hey guys, Hop here. Over the last week or so, I was peripherally involved in a controversy surrounding the Lead and Steel LP1 Promethean Red Dot, an optic which I've never used and haven't talked about before on this channel. But Focus Trip here on YouTube has reviewed the LP1. Let's see if we can play six degrees of Kevin Bacon to figure out how I ended up being involved in that. So, Focus Trip reviews the Promethean LP1. Lead and Steel took exception to some of the things he said in that video. They filed a cease and desist against him and also threatened a lawsuit. Then their CEO made a video kind of implying that Focus Trip has autism. I'm not going to speak to that. In that video, they also addressed a comment that I made on Focus Trip's original review video, and they called me a jackass. So Focus Trip gets the cease and desist, the threat of a lawsuit, gets called autistic. I just get called a jackass. I think I did okay. Probably shouldn't have made a video calling me a jackass. Not because it's untrue, I'm absolutely a jackass. It's just that, you know, you're the CEO of a real company that makes and sells products. I'm a working class gun reviewer who reviews red dots based on how well they work with night vision. The reason that I've never talked about the Lead and Steel Promethean LP1, despite requests from multiple viewers and Lead and Steel to review one, is that I've never really been that interested in it. It didn't really seem to offer anything that I really care about when it comes to red dots. Its main selling point seems to be durability. Durability is such a nebulous concept for a red dot that I've never been particularly interested in it. There are several optic reviewers on YouTube, including Focus Strip, including Sage Dynamics, who do durability drop testing on red dots. I find that process to be so wildly unscientific that I'm not particularly interested in doing it myself, and I really only watch those tests out of sort of casual interest. Uh, they don't make or break my buying decisions at all. The EOTech, for example, is a famously rugged, indestructible site because of the way the holographic reticle is created. The front and back panes of the EOTech optic don't have anything to do with actually displaying the reticle, meaning that you can get them both shattered out and the thing will still continue to function. I don't ever really bring that up because that's not why I like EOTechs. I like them for the night vision performance and all the other benefits of holographic sights. I think somebody did a test one time where they shot an EOTech with a shotgun to prove how durable it was. And I mean, I guess that's mildly interesting, but if I ever took a shotgun blast to the optic, I think I would also take most of a shotgun blast to the face and eyes. And so the durability of my optic would no longer be the deciding factor in that gunfight. Aside from its theoretical durability advantages, the Promethean LP1 seems to be a pretty mediocre red dot at a mediocre price. It's a very large, heavy red dot, and if I'm going to commit to that much ass on top of my rifle, then I'm probably going to go with an EOTech or a Sig Romeo 8T because I'm chasing night vision performance, and those two are still completely unbeaten. The Romeo 8T also has fallen in price to the point where it's pretty close to the LP1, so it's just very difficult to make a case for the LP1, even on paper. And that's before I get my hands on it and potentially expose additional flaws. As for the comment that I left on Focus Strip's original review, I pointed out that the hype surrounding the LP1 seemed a little bit artificial, which is not uncommon for a new product because of the way new products have to be introduced to the market. There's almost always going to be a period at the beginning of availability where the only reviews are from influencers or media personnel who got their hands on a product early and those reviews are timed to release at the same time generally as the announcement of the product becoming available. So it's a very nice synergistic system. Somebody hears about a new product, they go look for reviews, there are a bunch of reviews already ready to go, most of which, it's safe to say, are going to be more like first impressions reviews, and they're probably not going to be overly critical, but this is not always a bad thing. For example, this happened fairly recently with the Midwest Industries Alpha AK furniture. It was announced at SHOT Show, and then a while later, a bunch of them started showing up in the hands of media people. Everybody got their AK with the Midwest Industries furniture to review. Those reviews all started dropping at the same time, but nobody could actually get their hands on the Midwest Industries Alpha furniture. So what they had to do was back order or pre-order it or whatever, based entirely on the strength of a marketing campaign and a bunch of reviews of, you know, uh, questionable provenance, questionable levels of critical thinking. 
like I said, this isn't always a bad thing. I think consumers are now getting their hands on the Midwest Industries Alpha furniture, and it sounds like it's fine. So the same thing happened to the Promethean LP1. There were a lot of units in the hands of influencers, but no actual consumers were able to buy them because they were initially only available for a pre-order. Also, this is kind of barely a complaint, but the pricing structure of the LP1 seems a little bit home shopping network to me. The fact that they initially claimed that the MSRP was what, whatever is $700, but that if you ordered now, you could get one for 250 bucks at an introductory price, but the introductory price wouldn't last long. Uh, you know, on the one hand, I understand you're trying to get some people to take a chance on a new product, but on the other hand, man, that's just, I don't know, tone deaf, I guess. It just, it uh, strikes a lot of people as being gross and weird. So anyway, if you are a fiend for industry drama like I am, I highly recommend you follow along with the whole saga, Focus Trip's initial review of the LP1, Lead and Steel's response to him, and then his response to their response. I don't feel like it's worth rehashing the entire thing here. I think Focus Trip's response video pretty much sums it up. There is one thing that I still think is worth talking about, and that is the existence of a Turkish red dot from a company called 3EEOS. This red dot gets posted around all the time when people start talking about lead and steel. They have a red dot called the CRS, which looks extremely similar to the LP1. So given that the CEO of lead and steel is of Turkish heritage, I think people drew some pretty obvious connections and were like, oh, okay, so they're just importing a Turkish red dot. I don't actually think that's true. Lead and Steel has a pretty comprehensive post on Reddit describing the history of the design process of the actual LP1, and their version places the design of that red dot being done in conjunction with the Chinese company that helps them manufacture and source parts in around 2020. The earliest that I can find evidence of this Turkish CRS Gen 1 red dot being available is 2021, and then now they very recently announced a Gen 2 version, which is a kind, of, kind of a further departure from the lead and steel LP1. So Lead and Steel's theory is that this Turkish company went to some Chinese optics manufacturers looking for an optic that they could import and rebrand under their own brand umbrella, which makes sense. I don't think that Turkey can make an entire red dot on their own any more than the United States can. That is also something that we've seen happen before with a company called Falka, which is a German optics company who, as near as I can tell, just imports Chinese red dots and puts the name Falka on the side. People have been asking me periodically, hey, are you going to review these new, surprisingly affordable German red dots? And I think that there's uh, a big part of that sentence should worry you, and it's German and surprisingly affordable. It is surprising how affordable those are for being German. The answer is that they're not German. They're just Chinese red dots that are contracted by a German company. So... A very similar thing is most likely happening with this 3 eos They went to some Chinese optics companies, found a design that they liked. Maybe they asked for a few changes to be made to it as evidenced by the differences between their Gen 1 and Gen 2. Started importing it and selling it in Turkey. I don't think you'd even get those here. It's probably a very similar red dot to the Promethean LP1 because a lot of the parts are coming from China. We can also see this sort of thing happening with Sig Sauer optics. A lot of people believe that Sig Sauer optics are just completely made in China. Some of them are. The lower end stuff like the Sig Romeo 5 is built in China and imported into the United States. The higher end stuff like the Romeo 4T Pro, the 8T, uh, the Sig Tango 6T, those optics are made in their facility in Portland or at least assembled there. But that facility, as large as it is, isn't big enough for them to also produce printed circuit boards and uh, optical quality glass and have a machine shop that's churning out all of these uh, aluminum machined housings. So of course, a lot of that stuff is going to have to be done elsewhere, and then those parts are going to be brought in for final assembly. I would be surprised if there is a single fully American-made red dot that just comes from one shop. Almost inevitably, pieces are going to be brought in from different contract companies. For example, printed circuit boards. Not a lot of people can just go ahead and whip up a fabrication facility to make printed circuit boards. So they are going to have to source them from somewhere, and there's only so many places that those come from. Same thing with optical quality glass. There are only so many places in the world where you can get optical quality glass. That's why, like, almost every rifle scope is made in Japan. One thing that might set your mind at ease about SIG, at least, is that they are a DOD contractor. They have a whole bunch of defense contracts to make optics for the military and guns for the military, and apparently that means that they're restricted in where they can source their parts from. So if you're really afraid of uh, Chinese circuit boards going rogue inside your red dot, well, 
consider getting one of the SIG uh, 4XT Pros because it would be illegal for them to use a Chinese circuit board. So it's going to have to be from, I don't know, wherever, wherever circuit boards come from. Probably not far away from China, or it's probably in Oregon somewhere. I think that there are a lot of silicon companies still here in the silicon forest. The last examples to bring up would be, of course, the EOTech and the Vortex Huey. The Vortex Huey is always marked with assembled in the United States with a UK reticle. I think that's because the technology to produce holograms is just ridiculously complicated. Therefore, it's going to be done at a specialist facility that already does holograms, and then those pieces are going to be imported. And of course, I assume that as large as they are, Vortex still cannot machine the bodies, source the glass, get the printed circuit boards, all that stuff in-house for the Huey. So is what Lead and Steel says about the design, manufacture, and sourcing of the Promethean LP1 true? Probably. I don't think they would lie about that. Or at least I don't think they would get away with it. Maybe their reputation isn't as sterling as it once was after recent events, but I still think we can take that post at face value for now. Last thing is to address some comments on that video from InRange TV and Russell Fagan. InRange leapt to the immediate defense of lead and steel on that video in a way that made me a little bit suspicious that perhaps InRange TV has a friendship with lead and steel that compromises their objectivity, at least as it regards to that product going forwards. Even though I'm sure no money has exchanged hands, it does seem like there's a friendship there which has certainly colored their perception of those events. Everybody has those friendships. You can't be in the industry very long without picking up one or two. It's probably a good idea to disclose them when you're talking about products. For example, I can no longer review rifles from Munition Works because the owner operator of Munition Works is now a good friend of mine. Uh, that just sort of happened on accident. Turns out we both like Age of Empires too. As far as Russell Fagan's comment calling me an ADHD Zoomer, uh, that one made me wonder if either he doesn't watch my content or he got me confused with somebody else entirely. I'm happy to host one of the driest shows on GunTube, with the exception, of course, of InRange TV, but Carl films all of his content in a desert, so he does have an unfair advantage. Those comments from Russell have, I think, since been deleted. I can no longer see them, so that sort of lends credence to my theory that he got me confused with somebody else. If that's the case, check your fire next time, Russell. All right, thank you guys very much for watching. This has been surprisingly way more fun than I thought it was going to be. Uh, yes, I'm sure a lot of people will talk about how much they hate industry drama, but boy, it sure is fun when you're uh, <laughs> tangentially involved, but your livelihood isn't quite threatened. So thank you guys for watching. Thank you for your continued support. If you have any questions, let me know in the comments below, and I will talk to you guys next time.